it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Hide and Seek An old friend of mine emailed this to me a while back with the subject line, Hide and Seek and I've been hesitant to post it for reasons that should become obvious as you read it. That said, I feel that enough time has gone by for this to be well, safe, so I'm going to post it here. The only edits I've made were swapping out names and formatting, otherwise it's all exactly as he sent it. T, if you're reading this, then message me. I want to know if you're alright, and if you are, I know you'll be looking for this story to show up. This is what the email said. Gento, I'm writing this story because I feel like I need an outlet. I swear to God that you better actually check your email for once in your damn life. Please. As for if you actually are reading this, I want you to wait as long as your admittedly better judgment tells you to wait and then post this story online. I know it's a bit vain, but... I want people to know my story. Hell, it might be the last one I ever tell. Double hell it might actually even help some poor soul out. I'm going to disappear after sending this. Hopefully the uh, good kind of disappearing, not the death kind. I know nobody but you is going to believe this story, but damn if typing this out didn't make my sorry ass feel better. You were right about that, man. I'm sorry for giving you shit for writing so much. T. And this is the attached file. Hide and seek. Now, before I get into the hiding and seeking, I have a bit of a confession that needs to be made. I work as a transporter for a deep web black market site. I hope it doesn't change your opinion of me too much. Sorry for not telling you sooner. I'm the guy they call in when they get an order for something they can't send through the mail. Guns and live animals are two good examples. You'd be pretty hyped to know how many rich assholes just order lions and tigers from the dark web. Well, for obvious reasons, I can't go into too much detail. I don't want to make too many dangerous enemies, and even after this, I still don't want to lose my job. It's a pretty sweet gig, all things considered. All I have to do is pick up from the seller and deliver to the buyer. I can even choose what jobs I want to take. Let's me cling to what little principles I still have. Oh, and I do have principles. After a few years of working for the site, my two rules were no people and no crossing borders. Anyways, I got into a bit of a bind with the cryptocurrency crash that happened earlier this year. The site pays mostly in Bitcoin, and, well, I decided to let my wallet sit and grow. By the time I realized what had happened... My savings were destroyed. Nobody expected it to crash that hard, and it probably wouldn't have been as much of a problem if I hadn't also gotten used to living a life full of, well, the finer things. I didn't really save all that much to begin with either. So when my savings finally ran dry and the market was still down, I decided to lower my standards a bit and take a riskier, higher-paying job. Organ transport. I hadn't done it before, and I... Hadn't been that broke in a long time. Organ jobs pay well, too, and I figured I still wasn't strictly breaking my no-people rule if it was just their organs. So I hopped on the site and browsed through the pitiful number of requests in my area till I found what I was looking for. A rich buyer who had, well, shady connections, was in need of some organs and lacked either the time or patience to wait for them to come legally. As far as these sorts of requests went... This was pretty much the norm from what I'd heard. So I accepted the job and got an email with some additional details about the order. The customer needed two kidneys, which is what I was to transport, and a liver, which they'd made a separate request for. Now, from what other people on the side have told me, what should have happened was the job would move to the seeking seller section and I'd be on hold till someone acquired the kidneys. What actually happened probably should have tipped me off to use my monthly free withdrawal. I got a notification two hours later that there was a seller. 
Argento. Don't know how much you know about medicine, but if you do know anything, then you're probably squirming in your own skin about right now. now for those who may or may not be reading this that are not in the know, not only do the donor and receiver have to be compatible blood types, but kidneys only last about a day outside a warm body. Not exactly a product you can stockpile. Well, I got another email, about the pickup this time, and began the internal debate between the bad feeling in my gut and my empty wallet. Well, you can probably guess which one of them won out. Anyways, I planned my route, one hour to get to the seller, and four hours to get from there to the buyer. I sent the site my plan, and within minutes they approved of it, and set up an actual meeting point. I sighed and grabbed my things trying to swallow my nerves for the entire hour it took me to reach the meeting point. I sat down on a bench in a city park and waited for what seemed like ages before I felt someone staring at me. It took me a solid minute to pick out who it was, even though there were only a few people around. He was sitting with his back to me at a picnic table about ten yards away from me, and whenever I looked away, I could feel his eyes on me. When we eventually did make eye contact... He bounced excitedly in his seat and waved me over. My heart sank as he also slid a small case into my line of sight. I forced myself to smile, walked over, sat down, and hid my annoyance. Most of the buyers on the site were practically carbon copies of each other, probably because you could only become a buyer if another buyer knew and endorsed you. The sellers, on the other hand, were all certifiably insane. None of the other transporters I'd chatted with had ever met a normal seller. And because of this, all of them quickly learned to keep conversation to a minimum and to not under any circumstances piss any of them off. I decided to follow in their example. The man sitting in front of me looked friendly enough. Overly so, if anything. He was scrawny. Didn't look like he'd be strong enough to, well, kill someone and harvest their insides. He had a strange smile on his face. And even now I can't get that out of my head. The kind of overly friendly, wide tooth smile that mothers warn their children to stay away from. Some I managed to be both inviting and creepy at the same time. I smiled and spoke up. So, um, you're the seller then? I asked, and the man nodded. He responded in a sickeningly sweet voice. He sounded like a child in a toy store. His voice strained with excitement and wonder as he droned on to his parents about what toys he wanted. Oh, I'm so glad you found me. For a minute there, I thought I'd have to call Ollie Ollie Oxenfree, he said with a pleased sigh, pushing the case to my side of the table. You know, over the years I've gotten quite good at playing hide-and-seek. So good, in fact, that I've never been found. Not even once. Oh, do you want to know my secret? The man asked his voice still just as unsettlingly sweet as his smile. Um, sure. What's your secret? I asked. I really, really didn't want to know what the hell he was talking about, but if it kept him happy then, well... He clapped rapidly and bounced in place. Oh, I'm so glad that you're a curious one. My secret is that the Seekers never know that they're playing. <laughs> Makes sense, I said opening the case momentarily to verify. Two kidneys in pristine condition, doused with preserving fluid, wrapped in plastic, and packed in ice. Well, um, if the seeker doesn't know they're playing, then... then how would they know to start looking? I said, leaving out the fact that it would just be stalking at that point, before swallowing hard, when I thought about where these kidneys had come from. <laughs> You're a smart one he said, with a smile as I sent a message confirming the pickup. All that was left was to wait for the transaction to process. I was worried about this last one, though. Oh, she came right up to me. This close, he said, leaning in till our faces almost touched. I struggled to keep my composure. I managed to keep from jumping or pushing him away. So, what did you do? I asked as he leaned back, my suspicions about these kidneys being all but confirmed. Why, nothing of course, he said, a slightly bewildered expression on his face. 
It looks as though I'd just asked him how to breathe. I glanced down at my phone to see if the transaction had been verified yet, and he snapped his fingers like he remembered something. Oh, I must apologize, he said, making me look up. I forgot that you don't play much. I simply held my breath, closed my eyes, and wished that she would just go away. Hmm, you're right. You are good at hide and seek, I said, wishing to myself that he would just go away, and hearing the familiar ding of a successful transaction sound on both of our phones, as if to answer my prayers. I reached out my hand as a formality, and he grabbed it and shook it vigorously. I forced a smile and stood, although what he said next made my blood nearly freeze. Oh, you're the first person to find me in oh so long. He trailed off as he said it, his voice slowly shifting from that of an excited child to the cold-blooded maniac that he was. Maybe my games won't be so one-sided from now on he said, his voice disturbingly normal. Although, even without looking back, I could tell that the same sickeningly sweet smile was glued to his face. I kept walking, but waved my arm as though saying goodbye. The worst part was I could feel him watching me as I walked back to my car. Not just at first, like as if he was watching me leave, but the entire way back, and even as I got in my car. I took a moment to look around and sighed as I saw nothing. It might not sound like much to you. I don't know. I can still hardly describe it myself. But he had this creepy way of getting under your skin just by talking to you. Well, I wrote it off as just me being paranoid. The guy harvests organs from people for a living, so of course everything he says is creepy. I groaned and started my car, but it wasn't until I hit the freeway that I was able to finally shake the feeling of his gaze. Well, it's not like he could have been following me, but by then I was already paranoid enough to be checking for that, making a few detours just to be sure of it. And because of my detours, I ended up being about an hour past the scheduled drop-off with the buyer. Lost my chance for a tip, for sure. The guy was furious and there was nothing I could tell him to calm him down. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Oh, sorry I'm late, but the seller was a total psycho and I wanted to make sure he wasn't following me. Wouldn't have been a very good excuse. Whatever. I had my money and the buyer had his organs and plenty of time for whatever operation that used them. Not much to complain about on either side, well, except for the fact that I already knew I wouldn't be sleeping that night. Especially because the feeling of being watched had returned as soon as I set foot out of my car, which was, again, impossible. The site never tells the sellers anything about the buyers or transporters, so there's no way he could have known where I was headed, and no way he could have followed me. I hopped back in my car and started to head for home, hoping that a few tabs of melatonin would be enough for at least a few hours of sleep. But again, I could feel eyes on me as I drove, and I saw his eerie smile everywhere until I hit the highway. I felt a weight lift off my shoulders then, although I made sure to take the most winding path home that I could afford gas for, which was quite a bit after a job like that. Now, by the time I did get home, it was starting to get dark, and I had made a few loops around my apartment just to be sure I didn't still feel his eyes on me. Luckily, my apartment building has a public parking garage attached to it, so even if I was being followed, I felt safe enough that nobody would be able to find my room. But just to be sure took the stairs for the first time in months. Well, have any of you ever climbed seven flights of stairs out of paranoia before? Well, in case you haven't, let me tell you what it's like. Do you remember running up the stairs from the basement after turning off the lights as a kid? The feeling of unease and terror. Well, it's like that, but you aren't a kid anymore. It's not the dark or what imaginary monsters could be lurking in that that frightens you anymore. Uh, instead, you're worried about who could be hiding in the darkness. What real monster could be following you up those stairs? Now, I'm no slouch when it comes to exercise, but it still drained everything out of me, hauling my body up those stairs on my hands and feet like an animal as fast as I could. I got inside and locked the door securely behind me, panting, covered in sweat, 
but I sighed in relief with the fact that I hadn't felt anyone watching me at all during my climb. I took a moment to catch my breath, slumping down by the door and chuckling to myself while shaking my head. I couldn't believe I'd let that free get so deep under my skin. Once I caught my breath, I stood up and made my way to my couch before flopping onto it. I wanted nothing more than to go to sleep then and there. But I had to be smart with my money this time. I immediately cashed the Bitcoin out. Better to pay myself out in small increments, but I had bills to pay and I'd already learned my lesson about leaving things in Bitcoin. Once business was taken care of, I grabbed the remote control and flipped on the TV. The familiar faces of the local news anchors greeted me, and I began drifting off to sleep while listening to the happenings of our city. It was around 7am when I was woken up by the sound of the breaking news alert coming on. We're just receiving reports of a ghastly murder of one... Yeah, I'm not going to put her name or age here. College student living on her own. Police investigators say that several of her organs were found to be missing and they'd found evidence of someone living in her home without her knowledge for quite some time before the murder. The reporters kept talking about how much of a tragedy the situation was, but I wasn't listening. How could I listen? I've never been less happy to be right than I was at that moment. I shuddered thinking about it. My thoughts and paranoia regarding the man I'd met the other day bubbling back up to the surface. It was then that the reality of what I'd done hit me like a freight train. By accepting that contract, I doomed that girl to die. All because I needed some quick cash. I stood up and went to the kitchen and opened my liquor cabinet. Without looking, I grabbed a bottle of something with shaking hands and fumbled with the top while trying to keep my mind clear of thoughts. Once I had the cap off, I took several deep swigs from the bottle spilling quite a bit down my chin before I set it down and gasped for air. The burn of the alcohol in my throat gave me something to focus on while it worked its magic on the rest of my body. As my mind slowly clouded, I found my way to a chair and found it easier to think about what had happened without panicking. My first thought was that I needed to do something. I knew the guy's face. I should go to the cops. It was at this moment that the uh, less impulsive side of my brain kicked in. I go to the cops and all I do is give myself a one-way ticket to an early grave. My employers don't take kindly to police interactions. I slowly resigned myself to the fact that I was going to have to live with the consequences of this job for the rest of my life. Yeah, I'm a coward, I know. Anyways, the next few days passed slowly. I was not in a good place mentally and I'm sure you remember how much alcohol my cabinets were stocked with. I blacked out more than once, only to wake up gasping for breath from drinking too much. It was honestly a miracle that I didn't kill myself through alcohol poisoning. But I managed to come to terms with everything. Oh, don't get me wrong, I still had nightmares where I was the guy hiding in the girl's closet. But I wasn't drinking my problems away anymore. Although I think that that was more because of the fact I'd run out of liquor than any meaningful character development. It was about a week later when I was finally able to get my first night of actual sleep. I didn't dream about anything either, so that was a plus. I know it probably sounds bad, but I was starting to feel normal again, like I could maybe find a way just to be myself. Either way, even after all that, I still wanted to keep my job. I just added a new rule. No organs. From there I fell back into more or less my old routine. I went out to eat almost every day, though. I thought any excuse that got me cleaned up and out of my place was worth taking. And then I began to feel it again. That skin-crawling sensation of eyes on me from somewhere that I felt the day I met Mr. Hide and Seek. I didn't think much of it at first. I only felt the eyes when I was surrounded by other people, so of course one or two would be looking my way, right? I thought I was just guilty and paranoid. But no matter what I did, I'd always feel like I was being watched whenever other people were around. So I started driving more and more and eating out less and less. Not driving anywhere in particular, just driving. I felt safe on the open road. I couldn't feel any eyes on me. Well, for about a week, that is. It started small. A shiver down my spine here and there. The sharp sensation that made my eyes snap to one car or another. 
Then it came more frequently, and I began to get more and more paranoid as the feeling became stronger and stronger. I started driving less and less, and whenever I did, I kept my eyes on the cars around me, trying desperately to find where that feeling was coming from, to find who was watching me, trying to catch a glimpse of his face in a passing car. I even thought I did see him a few times, except that was just paranoia, my hope. Eventually, I stopped driving unless I had to. I shut myself in my apartment, only going out to get groceries and always, always making sure that I didn't feel anyone watching me before I parked. But that feeling would always find me whenever I went out. Well, this went on for about a month. I started to drink again. I didn't go out to eat or drive anymore. I paid someone to deliver my groceries to the garage of my building. All I did was eat, sleep, drink, and watch movies or play games. I'd be living the dream if I didn't think a serial killer was stalking me. Part of me believed that I was just being paranoid, and to be honest, I desperately wanted to believe that part of me, but not enough to stake my life on it. And after another week of living like a shut-in, the feeling of being watched started to resurface. Like before, it started off small. I felt a ping of eyes on me, and from then on I kept the blinds securely closed. Even then, the feeling persisted for days, gradually gathering in strength. So I emptied out all my closets and cabinets daily. Eventually, I just left all of the doors open and everything on the floor so I could look into any hiding spot in an instant. But that feeling still persisted. I stopped drinking because I was terrified of being attacked. I started sleeping less and less, and when I had to sleep, I slept inside of my closet and barred the door shut from the inside. I ate and drank only when I felt hungry and always with my back to a corner of the room or locked in my closet. But I could still feel eyes on me, feel his eyes on me the same way I had back at the park. It was about a month later when I finally discovered my haven. The one place left that I didn't feel watched. The stairwell of my building. I found that whenever I went down and back up the stairs to get my groceries, as I'd long since stopped using the elevator, then I would have a brief respite from the feeling of being watched. I started to spend all my waking hours there, sat on one of the stairs without a care in the world. I only left them to eat and sleep, and whenever I entered the building proper, I'd feel eyes on me almost immediately. But having those stairs to return to made my life almost bearable. It had been a long time since I'd had anywhere I felt safe, and, and like every place before it, I kept waiting for the feeling of being watched to follow me into the stairwell. But it never did. For another month, I fell into a somewhat bearable rhythm. I'd wake up in my closet feeling watched, I'd eat in the corner of my kitchen, feeling washed, and then I'd scurry off to the stairwell where I could feel blessedly alone, especially near the top floors where the stairs were seldom used. But all good things must come to an end and all that. And while I never did feel watched in the stairs, I did run out of money. Apartments and cars don't pay for themselves, after all, and while I managed a few months on the blood money from my last job, it was finally time to get back to work. In the months since I'd last logged onto the site, things had calmed down significantly, and there were now plenty of jobs that didn't break any of my rules. So I decided to go with a route that I'd done before a couple of times. A gun run. The seller always treated me to a drink or two at his bar, and was also always well armed, so I felt that it would be a nice and easy job that I could feel safe doing. After confirming the job, I closed my laptop pulled on a fresh set of clothing and headed out the door. I wanted to get this over and done with, and thankfully the feeling of being watched was rather light that day. I do admit, however, that I lingered in the stairwell for a bit before heading out. I wanted a bit of time alone before being out in the open for the first time in months. Anyways, I hopped in my car after about 30 minutes of blessed stairwell time and headed to the bar. After about two hours of paranoid and twisting driving, I managed to make it just in time and pulled my car into the alleyway behind the bar. The owner greeted me with a smile as I got out. T, long time no see, he said. 
his smile fading as I walked up and he got a better look at me. Holy shit, man. You feeling okay? He asked, genuine worry in the eyes of this large man. No, I'm pretty far from okay, I said with an exhausted sigh. I could still feel the faintest hint of eyes on me, even now, though I know that the owner wouldn't let me be jumped at his bar. It's a long story, I offered, realizing for the first time that it might be nice to actually tell someone what had happened. Ah, is that so? He said with a hint of a smile and a shake of his head. Well, how's about we get you a drink while the boys get ready to load up your car? He offered in return, making me smile. There's always plenty of time for stories of my bar, he said proudly. Oh, I'd like that, I said with another exhausted sigh, managing to keep the smile up as he put an arm around me and led me in the back door of the bar. Oh, by the way, how'd you hold up during the Bitcoin crash? Heard it hit a couple of transporters pretty hard, he said, making me chuckle as we made our way through the kitchen. Funny you should mention that, I said, making him raise an eyebrow. Because that's how my long story st- I began, only to stop short when I looked at the bar. He was sitting there, sipping on a beer without a care in the world. He noticed me out of the corner of his eye, and that same sickeningly sweet smile crept onto his face as his eyes met mine. I froze. There was no way that this was a coincidence. There was no way that he just happened to be at this bar at this time. I was broken from my trance by the bar owner, waving his hand in front of my face and saying my name. Hello? T, you alright? I quickly ducked back into the kitchen and started to hyperventilate. How did he know? How could he have possibly known that I'd be here? Did he follow me? Did who follow you? The owner's voice brought me back to reality once again as I realized I'd been thinking out loud. His face was concerned, bordering on scared. How long has that guy been at the bar? I asked, hoping that the owner knew who I was talking about. Oh, if you mean tall, thin, and creepy, then about an hour. What's going on, T? He asked as I slumped against the wall. I started crying. I broke down and burst back into the bar only to see that Mr. Hyden Seek was already gone. Oh, I need to go. I need to get home, I said, pushing past the owner and running to my car. He called after me, trying to get me to stay and explain what the hell was happening, but I wasn't listening. For all I know, Mr. Hyden Seek could be breaking into my apartment already. I drove straight home and threw open the door to my apartment. It had still been locked, but I wasn't taking any chances. I grabbed a knife from the kitchen and checked everywhere. But he wasn't there. And then my phone rang and scared the living hell out of me. I checked the number and gulped when I saw it was blocked. I considered not answering it, but in the end, I picked up the call. Uh, hello? I asked tentatively. Gee, what the hell happened at the bar? A modulated voice rang through the speaker in my ear, making me wince. It was one of the site admins for sure. I was silent for a moment before telling the admin everything. I couldn't see the man, but I could feel a sudden change when I mentioned seeing Mr. Hyde and Seek at the bar. T, the admin began, a serious edge to his voice. I need you to log into the site now, he said, and something in me told me to listen. I booted up my laptop and hopped onto the site. As soon as I logged in, a dialogue appeared that I'd never seen before. Admin would like to take control of this computer. Do you consent to this? With two buttons. One for yes, one for no. I clicked yes and watched as my cursor began to move on its own. Thank you, T. This will only take a moment, the admin said. A practice calm in his voice as he downloaded several files and began to do something on my laptop. A minute later, a dialogue box popped up that said, Threat detected. And the admin sighed and his voice sharpened as he spoke. T, you've been compromised. You've had a nasty piece of spyware installed on your machine for about a month by the looks of things. It's been recording your keystrokes and giving someone remote access to your camera. 
the admin explained, making me gulp as I realised that all of my information was insecure. But <laughs> there's no way I haven't downloaded anything, I said, making the admin mutter something as a bout of typing could be heard coming through the phone. The admin's voice was cold and calculated when he spoke next. No, no, you didn't, he said, making me gulp. This software was installed via USB, the admin said, making my heart nearly stop. Hide and seek had been in my home. He'd been here without me noticing and put that program on my laptop. Even after all of my paranoia, he still found his way into my room without me knowing. But I'm going to delete the program, the admin said. And a few keystrokes later, done. What the... As the admin deleted the program, Thousands of windows began popping up on the screen of my laptop, all of them saying the same thing. Ollie, Ollie, oxen free. After that, I threw my laptop in the trash and got a new one, as well as a new phone, SIM card and all. I was taking no chances. I got all new accounts for everything, and the admin told me he'd revoke Mr. Hide and Seek's membership personally. But, well... I'm going to disappear all the same. I have a plane ticket to somewhere, and my bags are already packed. Don't look for me. And if you ever start to feel like you're being watched, it's because you are. So finally we're back to the deep web. I haven't done a deep web story in a long, long time. I guess it was kind of a fad. The time seems to have passed, but they're always a lot of fun if you approach them as just stories. I mean, no other kind of story gets as many comments saying, oh, the deep web's nothing like this. Oh, no, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. It's just a story. It's just meant to be a bit of fun. Might not be realistic, but it doesn't really matter, does it? We're all here just to listen to a story and have a bit of fun before we go to bed. <laughs> or whatever you want to do, I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, nice one there. Um, well, back again very soon. Hope you enjoyed that one. Uh, doing something different next time. Got some longer stories lined up for you. Hour plus stories. Two hours maybe sometimes. Even more. Oh my god. Well, a lot lined up for you. Hope you're going to join me again very soon. Say you will, please. Go on. All right. Till next time, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram... You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.